know how to completely confuse and alienate your fan base to a fantasy movie? Change fucking everything! But now that I think about it, I may have actually said too much. I've oversold the dread of Beastmaster 2. I've ruined the surprise. To really understand the sucker punch to the gut that is Beastmaster 2, let's go back in time, as it were. Let's pretend it's 1991, and you're a fan of the first movie, so let's take a look at the poster like you're a fan, and this is the first you've heard there's a sequel. Oh, hey, wow, look, guys, they're making Beastmaster 2. That movie was... Oh, fuck. Oh, for Christ's sake, what are they doing? Wait, wasn't the tiger black before? And where's the redhead with the killer wreck? Oh, fuck, this is gonna blow worse than Conan the Destroyer. Yep, they put the Beastmaster in modern Earth. I mean, hey, it really helps save money when all the actors can just wear street clothes and you don't have to buy costumes or spend money on set design and... You can just shoot most of the movie in a car and point the camera out the window or shoot a bunch of scenes at a producer's house of the heroes just sitting around watching TV. A lot of movies did this in the 80s and 90s especially, taking a hero from a fantastic fantasy world and then just dumping him in a modern city so we never actually have to see it. Like Suburban Commando, Hercules in New York, Masters of the Universe, and many others that all had one other very important thing in common. They all fucking sucked! So, to recap the events of Beastmaster 1, Dar freed his people by defeating the evil priest Maox, destroyed his dark army, and left his brother on the throne to rule with justice and fairness. So let's forget about that, because the opening crawl of this movie tells us the world is now consumed in darkness and has been conquered by a dude named Arklon, and the only hope for freedom lies with a rebel alliance marshalling in the east under the leadership of the Beastmaster. Oh, wait, no. I guess they're not marshalling under anybody since Dar's been captured by Arklon from the very first second of the movie. Great. Not even the opening crawl knows what's going on. What chance do we have? Dar is taken to the evil warlord's dread fortress. Wait, what's that? What? Oh, we couldn't afford a dread fortress? Oh, okay. I, I guess a cave will do. He's only conquered the entire world, but come on, that guy's not made of money. It's the best the poor guy could do. So this is the Beastmaster. The one who defeated our high priest, Maox, and now challenges my authority. That was an odd gesture. I'm not sure why I did that. Did you actually believe that you and your flock of peasants could overthrow my kingdom? My glorious kingdom in this cave I'm hiding in, with nobody really in it. Did you? Did you notice how much I look like Kiefer Sutherland? Dar's about to be executed for treason when suddenly his tiger attacks and rescues him, taking everyone by surprise. Wait, what? The Beastmaster's using wild animals to help him escape? How could anyone have possibly foreseen this? If he escapes! I'd help, but I didn't sleep all that well last night, so I'll just hang back here. I like how the judges just sort of sit there while Dar is slaughtering everyone. And this is where you start to realize this movie's fight choreography is really half-assed and played mostly for laughs, pandering to kids instead of the previous movie's adult focus. I mean, you might as well just add stars circling around this guy's head. Dar is outright dominating the soldiers, so that's when Archelon whips out a plasma gun from Halo. Oh! Kinda pulls about four feet low, that thing. Of the beast. <laughs> the vultures shall have their feast after all. Oh shit, attacking eagles? Run! Grab a coat hanger! Dar started the birdemic! And here they come! <laughs> the eagles killed Becky! Let us depart before somebody really gets hurt. Goodbye, my faithful eagle! Hope everything works out with the 280-pound wizard! What? Oh. Oh, I guess we're still doing credits, huh? Man, that's a lot of screenwriters. Why did they separate them into three groups? I'm guessing R.J. Robertson and Jim Wynorski wrote the first shitty draft, and then Silvio wrote the second shitty draft, and then Ken Hauser and Doug Miles wrote the third shitty draft. And the really scary thought is that this is the draft they went with. Oh, and by the way, Silvio Tabot, uh, he directed this piece of fuck. Asshole. The rebels, in the meantime, are using a captured witch to find Arklon's army. The witch is played by Sarah Douglas, and my god, she is so fucking hot in this movie, it's almost worth watching just for spank material alone. Seriously, she's the only two reasons to see it. One act of betrayal, and I'll cleave your black heart from your bosom. 
Surely such a valiant warrior such as you can think of a better use for my bosom. <laughs> I guess he got the point. But Archon proves remarkably easy to find when he finds them and uses his magic gun to start killing everyone. Behold the key of Magog. Behold this magic thing that I got that will never be explained where I got it or what it really does. Seriously, see if you can count the number of powers the writers pull straight out of their ass for this magic wand. He shoots people in the face, sets them on fire with it, and he uses it to hurl boulders, which, oh, come on, are clearly made of styrofoam. Look at this! They used this take! I'm sorry, but it's impossible for me to take your movie seriously when the best effect so far is from the most extreme elimination challenge. I was screaming for dramatic effect. Well, I was moved by it. You know, you're a hard man to take a meeting with. That's why I arranged this little scene with the rebels here. Okay, be honest. Uh, raise your hand if you were listening to a single word she said just now. It is all part of what I want to show you, my lord. For it is I, the beautiful, sensuous, mysterious Lorana, who can make you the most powerful man on Earth. Can't breasts too magnificent. Why should I, Lord Arklon, maximum ruler of A-Rock, be any concern of yours? Chill out, Lord Dude. Chill out. Lord dude. I'm gonna need a minute, guys. Do you not wish to hear my secret? It looks like Victoria's secret to me. Anyway, Archon finally agrees, because come on, could you say no to those? And they ride off to the Guardian on the Edge of Forever? What sorcery is this? A dimensional portal. The doorway to your ultimate triumph, my lord. A world that exists on a parallel plane with our own. The natives call it L.A. L.A. They come from there. A place called Houston. And we will go there too. Yeah, notice how she said it was a dimensional portal, as in a portal to a world on a parallel dimension, as opposed to, you know, a fucking portal of time! In fact, she mentions specifically several times in this movie that time travel is in no way involved. Now, you could argue we're just talking a minor semantic detail, but I would argue it's only the fucking title! Asshole. I mean, a portal to parallel Earths? What's next? We're gonna run into one of the sliders coming the other way? Yes, Carrie Wurr from Sliders is in this movie. She plays a spoiled, wisecracking valley girl who accidentally crashes through the portal of time and finds herself in Dar's dimension. And let's just say she's not exactly the best ambassador our world could send. Where's the auto club when you need them? There's gotta be a main road around here somewhere. Oh, sure there does, because you were just in downtown L.A. one second, and then you're driving through an endless wasteland for hours. Not even the valley is this barren lady. Hey, are you one of those crazed bikers, you know, with the crossbows? My name is Dar. I come from the high mountains. Is there a telephone around here, maybe, that I could use? Or, or a 7-Eleven, even? Something like that? 7-Eleven? Oh. Hang on, perhaps my ferrets can speak your idiot language. <laughs> Whoa! Your bag's full of rats. <laughs> no, these are my ferrets. This is Kodo and Podo. Yes, I have two ferrets. You see, I had two before, and then one died in the last movie, and then the other one had two babies, and then died between movies, I presume. And so I named these two exactly the same thing. You know what? It's a long story. Hey, is that cat gonna come with us? His name is Ru. We travel everywhere together. Let's just hope the audience doesn't notice I have a striped tiger now instead of the old one we accidentally poisoned to death covering it with black paint because I also gave him the same name. I'm serious. The last tiger they got was striped as well, but they covered it in a black paint that turned out it was so toxic it ended up killing the poor thing. I mean, where the fuck was the guy from the American Humane Association? A what? Oh, you got that shipment of black toxic hair dye? Yeah, I just slopped that shit all over the tiger. It's not like cats lick themselves. I think he's starting to eat it. Ah, he's fine. 
Meanwhile, Ursa here is showing Archlon a weapon he can steal from Earth called the Neutron Detonator. It's compact enough to carry, yet powerful enough to destroy all life in an area the size of a continent. With the threat of such a weapon, I could rule unopposed. Oh no! If Archlon uses the Neutron Detonator, he'll turn a rock into a barren desert wasteland for all eternity- Oh! The Neutron Detonator will be yours! He'll rule the world! Of course! Continuity is sort of all over the place here, as Archlon somehow manages to catch up to Dar and incapacitates him with a stink bomb so he can recapture Carrie, and I really don't know why. I mean, does she look like she knows how to get a neutron detonator? Do you know where you are? The Twilight Zone. Where's Rod Serling? Oh, get it? Because she's from the future? So, uh, listen. Leatherface. How do you suppose I get back through this, son? Portal. <laughs> Leatherface. I shall be happy to take you in exchange for certain information. Information? Yes. Hell, I'm loaded with information, you know. I watch Jeopardy every night. Jesus Christ! Shut up! Is every line this character says a pop culture reference? We're on a quest. Well, you know, hey, I'm on a quest too. For gas. Shut up. Make it really difficult checking into a hotel. Shut up. It'll keep us alive. No thanks. I'll just stick with the salad bar. Shut up. A seeing eye bird. They stalk the night, searching for souls to drag down into the abyss. Sounds like a couple of guys I met in Tijuana last night. Shut up. Hey, rad. Shut up. Shut up. I get it. You're from the 90s. If I was playing a drinking game, I'd be in a fucking coma by now. 90s kid is written with more subtlety than you. <laughs> Dude, harsh! Dar, do you understand anything I say to you? No. Which is weird, considering we both somehow speak English despite this being a completely different world. The bad guys go through the portal into LA with Dar hot on their heels, but Archlon shoots a gas main blocking the alley behind him with a wall of flame and trapping Dar. So how did Archlon even know how a gas main works, or know that the gun would cause damage that specific to the pipe? Damn, if only I had some kind of bladed boomerang weapon my father gave me from the last movie I knew how to throw. He's trapped there so long that Uncle Phil drives there all the way from Bel Air to knock Dar out with a taser. Have somebody run a query on all loincloth freaks, there can't be that many of them. Have the whole thing on my desk tomorrow morning. Okay, come on, Uncle Phil. This is Los Angeles. You probably saw weirder shit than a dude in a loincloth with a tiger on the drive over here. Why are they looking at me like this? They're digging your royal attire, sire. Oh, God. Her dialogue has all the subtlety of a piano being dropped off a cliff. You gotta get yourself some fresh threads. An ancient warlord shopping for clothes in modern Los Angeles? Oh, I, I get the feeling things aren't gonna go exactly as planned. And what can we do to you? 